Yeah, General, can you hear me? This is Joshua Mazervi from the yes, Heritage I Foundation. Great. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Well, welcome. Um, really pleased you can you can join us this morning. Um, I'm uh, I'm just going to get us started right away if if you're ready, General. Yes, I am ready. Thank you very great. much. Okay, super. Uh, well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is is Joshua Mazervi. I'm a research fellow. Uh, uh, for uh, Africa at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, really pleased um, that General Sadkan has agreed to join us this morning to give his perspective on um, the, the conflict in Ethiopia. Uh, I'm going to move very quickly because uh, we have lots of people um, and uh, not a lot of time. So um, General Sadkan, of course, is one of the most important uh, strategic thinkers um, of his generation in all of Africa, I would say, and um, he was the first uh, chief of staff of the Ethiopian Defense Forces. Uh, he um, uh, was um, the uh, architect of, uh, one of the architects of the war against the Derg, the successful war against the Mengistu regime, and he's currently uh, a member of um, the Tigrayan Defense Force. Is, uh, Central Command, uh, Government of Tigray Central Command. Um, so, uh, General, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, for for your opening remarks and your opening reflections, uh, and then we'll uh, move to discussion and Q and A. Um, so, uh, the the floor is yours, General. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, as you have su suggested and uh, as the format of the discussion, I will give a brief uh, discussion of uh, what is on the ground with regard to the war that is being waged. It's not an ordinary conflict, it's a huge war. And at the same time, I will uh, discuss some issues with regard to the peace process. Uh, and then there will be a question and answer session. Uh, first, what I would like to uh, say is uh, say something about the situation on the ground with regard to the war. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and or transcribed. The assumption of uh, war started a month and a half ago. Uh, there were various fronts uh, that the war was being conducted. At this time, the main effort of the government of Ethiopia and government of Eritrea uh, jointly has concentrated mainly on the southern front, uh, starting from Waldia up into Tigray, and the uh, western front, which is from... Uh, Western Tigray, Walkai, Tibademe area to Ndasilase, to Shere Ndasilase. Their target is to reach Shere Ndasilase. In this, all Ethiopian forces, there are eight commands in Ethiopia. Uh, one command consists of three corps, and one corps, com or, uh, in one corps, there are three divisions. All together in one command, there are around 12 divisions. There are eight commands in the Ethiopian army currently, besides the uh, commando and Republican guards. And in addition uh, to this, there, there are around 19 divisions of uh, Amhara uh, Special Forces. All those forces are fighting now uh, against uh, the Tigrayan government, Tigrayan authority. Five of the commanders are in western Tigray, out of which three are attacking Tigray from Eritrea. Uh, Northwestern uh, Command, Eastern Front, I mean Eastern Command and Southern Command, plus three commando divisions. Uh, <clears throat> two commanders are attacking from uh, Western uh, Tigray, from the direction of Gwandar to Adarkai, and from the direction of Walkite 
towards the town of Shararo. Uh, two commanders and special forces are attacking. Uh, two and a half or something like that are uh, attacking from uh, the narration of Oldia. So those are the forces that are uh, attacking the uh, forces of uh, Tigray. On top of this, all air train forces, including reserve, have been mobilized. Uh, those are generally around 54 divisions, out of which six are mechanized divisions. Around half of all those forces are around 24 divisions are attacking uh, Tigrayan forces from Western Tigray in coordination with the Ethiopian forces. Around five to six divisions attacked from the Eastern Front, from the Barahale direction towards uh, Nagale. And I think you, you might have heard what has happened. This force has been temporarily neutralized. Whether the Air Train forces will continue to mobilize forces in that direction and attack Nagale is something that we are going to see in the future. Uh, the rest of the forces of Ertra are in the highlands of Ertra, around Zalambesa, Tarha, and uh, Mandefara Adhala direction. In the whole war, the main support of mechanized forces is from air train forces. Uh, the air trains have relatively uh, more mechanized uh, units, more tanks and more artillery. Uh, they have a huge arsenal of uh, ammunition. They don't have any problem because they have taken a lot from... Uh, the Ethiopian army, and they are being replenished continuously from Addis Ababa. Uh, logistical support is from Eritrea. Aerial support, we have to confirm yet, but including drone support is coming from Asmara, from Eritrea. Command both as, as a strategic and operational level is mainly vested on Eritrea generals. So, the main architect and implementer of this war is Ertra, the Ertra government, with the permission, close coordination, and invitation of the Ethiopian Prime Minister. Uh, in this huge uh, war where close to around one million people from both sides are General, you just went on mute. So if you could unmute yourself. How about now? Is it okay? Yeah, perfect. Uh, you, you cut off right after you said there was a million uh, men mobilized on each side. Yeah, roughly. Roughly around uh, close to one million, out of which uh, close to slightly less than one force are uh, forces under TDF. The rest are uh, from the other side. In this huge uh, war where we are blocked for uh, the last uh, roughly three years, the ground was blockaded uh, one year before the war. And it has continued, especially after the government of the ground controlled Merale. Uh, we are left alone with no other option except to fight for our survival. Uh, it is a declared intention of both the government of Ali Ahmed and the government of Shias Afurki to finish not only uh, TPLF and its associates, but Tigrayans in general, because of who they are. Uh, this war is, in, our, in my opinion, a regional war. Uh, it has extremely far-reaching implications. If they get their way, the whole geopolitical landscape will change. Uh, Isaias will be the boss of the region. He will definitely, he has already uh, brought Abi Ahmed into his pocket. Abi Ahmed doesn't have any other alternative except obey what uh, Isaias 
as tell him. It is public statement that uh, Isaias' next target is the Sudan. So the whole region, if Isaias could break the resistance of EDF and the Tigrayan people, he is out to dominate the region and implement his version of uh, governance, which is very much known. I don't need to go into that uh, uh, detail. Uh, so this is the consequence. And on the other hand, if the Tigrayan resistance prevails, there will be a chance for the region to restructure the whole politics in a way that benefits the, 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 the general public, all Ethiopians, including air trans as well. So it has far-reaching strategic implications in shaping the geopolitical situation in this part of the world where, you know, uh, as it's known, this region is situated in the western part of the Red Sea. Uh, the strategic significance of the Red Sea is very much known. I don't need to go into uh, that detail. Uh, above all, even if they win, even if, which, uh, which is not a uh, foregone conclusion, which is uh, difficult because we are fighting for our survival and we'll fight uh, on how we know to fight. But hypothetically, if they win, there will not be peace. Almost half of Ethiopian defense forces are in Eritrea. Whether those forces will be extricated or come out, out of Eritrea willingly is doubtful because it has a habit of retaining those forces and uh, using them for his own purpose. And uh, it has, Eritrea cannot dominate Ethiopia, even if they wish so, because it's not a matter of Abiy Ahmed. The whole Ethiopian population will not accept the domination of Tain Eltra, uh, the huge Ethiopia, which has far reaching implications. And Ethiopia cannot again reconquer Eltra. So the scenario, even if this war has been, um, has gone according to their script, it does not bring peace. It will bring another level of complicated political security challenges to the whole region. Uh, uh, of course, there are other uh, other actors in the region which have come to this uh, region as well. For example, I don't think anybody could predict clearly what the role of the Russians and the Middle Eastern countries will be in this part of the world. Because there is a relationship, established relationship. Uh, they have their own uh, national interests and geopolitical interests. They will try to use Isaias as a vehicle to further their interests in the region. So uh, not only there will not be peace on, in the region, but it will be an internationally complicated geopolitical situation uh, because of the strategic nature of uh, the areas that we are talking about. Uh, so if I say this much about the nature of the war, uh, who is actually um, leading and uh, the architect of the war, the next issue will be how do we extricate ourselves from the current predicament that we are in? Uh, for us, Tigrayans, peace is a strategic choice because of what we are, who we are, where we found ourselves to be. Uh, uh, only we demand that there is a credible and impartial peace process. Uh, we don't want to be controlled and dominated by other forces. We want to have a fair share of our role in the political dispensation of Ethiopia. Uh, but uh, the current arrangement is such that 
the desire is to not only dominate and control Tigray, but exterminate the population. I'm not talking to exaggerate the situation. They have done it in the, in the past. They will continue doing it in the future. They are doing it currently in the areas air trans and check and control in western Tigray, in Adiabo. They are raping, they are looting, they are killing, they are exterminating people. That's what is happening. So the only chance left for Tigrayans is to fight for survival or demand a credible and impartial peace process. That will resolve the problem. Uh, we have negotiated, uh, well, confidentially, uh, but now I don't think it's no more uh, confidential process. I don't need to go into details. We have met three times with the Ethiopian authorities. We have discussed, and I would like to thank the American government for organizing those uh, uh, meetings. Uh, without going into the details, in all the three occasions, we reached agreements. Uh, we abided ourselves by the agreements reached at that time. But we were betrayed in all three occasions. The last being the, the one that was done in Djibouti, where we came out with a clear proposal of a session of hostilities. And of course, what needs to be done in the session of hostilities. Uh, uh, this has been made clear in the, the proposal of the Ethiopian government on September 11 to the whole world. Uh, those proposals did not come out of the blue. They came on the basis of the meetings we had with the Ethiopian authorities at different times. And uh, in most of the issues that we have raised, we have discussed with them and reached some agreement. But betrayed. Uh, there is no, up to now, there is no response to our September 11 call uh, for an agreed cessation of hostilities. Our proposal is to end the carnage. We need to start a peace process. The peace process cannot start just simply by saying, let's, let's start a peace process. The first thing we have to do is we have to come into a cessation of hostilities. People are shooting at each other. This has to stop. There is a carnage that's being done. This has to stop. The first thing to do this is a cessation of hostilities. As you all know, cessation of hostilities is transitory. It can go to peace or it can go to war. We, from the Tigrayan side, would like it to go into a peace process. We don't want it as a truce. We want it to to go into a peace process where we agree a credible and impartial peace process. Uh, the objective of the cessation of hostilities has to be to create a conducive environment for the peace process to resume and peace prevail in Ethiopia. Uh, to do this, uh, there are certain things that we need, I mean, we feel have to be done. Number one, the cessation of hostilities with its clear objective of, you know, uh, putting it to lead us into a peace process, certain conditions have to be fulfilled. Those certain conditions are conditions that are not negotiable by international law. There has to be unfettered access for humanitarian aid. The service, the, the service, the service has to resume. It shouldn't have been blocked in the first instance. The constitutional boundary arrangements have to be respected because it's not only an issue of Ethiopia, but it's an issue of, I mean, an issue of Tigray, but it's an issue of Ethiopia as well. It could be discussed in, in appropriate time, but this has to be accepted as a modus operandi of the government with regard to border issues. Foreign forces has to go out. Because in the presence of foreign forces, not only simple spectators, but the main architects of 
of the war. They will not be peace. So during the session of hostilities, those forces have to go out. The force that has invited them, is cooperating with them, working with them, has to publicly tell them to go out, out of Ethiopia, out of Tigray. And there are other two important things that we feel should be fulfilled during the cessation of hostilities. Number one, there has to be a credible and impartial peace process architecture agreed. This peace process architecture has to, to have within itself, you know, important structures like, you know, mediators, like a group of panelists who mediate the process. Those have to be uh, credible and agreed by both parties. And if there is no agreement on both parties, by both parties, there are mechanisms to resolve this. There has to be international guarantors simply to see the process go through and uh, be finalized. More than that, the peace process needs a safeguard, to be safeguarded, because there are external actors who doesn't want this process to hold. The international guarantors have to give guarantee to A, the whole peace process, and at the same time, secure the peace process itself, uh, diplomatically, economically, whatever it takes. There has to be international experts who advise on the integrity of the peace process. There has to be a monitoring and verification mechanism to see that agreements are carried out properly. When we say this, we are saying we are ready to commit ourselves to such an arrangement. We would like the international community to commit to such an arrangement as well. We would like our partners, if they are serious, to commit to such an arrangement. A credible, impartial, properly designed and agreed peace process architecture, we feel, uh, could, uh, would help us resolve this process. Once this is agreed during the cessation of hostilities, there has to be some kind of a declaration of principles as well, which, uh, 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 which directs the trajectory of the peace process. The parties have to agree to certain principles to go into and respect in order to continue the peace process. Those are the demands you ask. We feel those demands are uh, not only fair, but at the same time, it demands us to be committed to the peace process. There is, uh, <clears throat> you know, there is a propaganda activity that tells, you know, the Tigrayans know how to fight, they don't want to go to peace. Uh, well, given our circumstances, if we are forced between subjugation, control, we'll fight. But we'd like to have a fair and credible, uh, impartial peace process, internationally designed and accepted, and we would like to abide ourselves by that process, and we'll accept whatever comes out of that process. We made this clear. The Ethiopian government rejected it. They told us they didn't want to go into cessation of hostilities, and uh, they didn't respond to uh, our call. After the cessation of hostilities and what needs to be done within a certain period of uh, time during the cessation of hostilities, then we can have a robust, credible, impartial peace process. We are ready to commit ourselves to such a process. We are ready to commit ourselves to an agreed cessation of hostilities. Uh, I would like to say something about, you know, the Africa. Uh, we have agreed on African-led process, but this shall not be, you know, meant a carte blanche to African Union to impose whatever they think is a proper uh, peace process upon us. It has to be discussed and agreed between the parties, not only between us, but between us and the Ethiopian government as well. Up to now, we haven't heard anything from the African Union. Nobody has contacted us. Rather, rather than designing a robust, credible, impartial peace process, the issue has become Mr. Obasanjo. Our uh, misgivings on the African Union and 
our opinion on Mr. Obasanjo has been made clear. With all our misgivings, we have accepted the Continental Organization, but we haven't changed our position on Mr. Obasanjo. We don't want to make Obasanjo an issue. What we are saying is, let's have a credible, impartial, robust peace process architecture in place, and then we take it from there. And there are modalities and traditions for this kind of a process to be put in place. Uh, uh, for the people of Tigray, as I said earlier, we don't have any other choice except to go into a credible, impartial peace process or fight for our survival. I don't know how much we have uh, explained this, the international community, but generally the feeling we have is Abiy Ahmed and Isaiah Saforki have been uh, given uh, a, black, uh, a blank sheet of paper to write whatever they want, to do whatever they want to uh, finish the whole situation by war and continue their extermination of the people of Tigray, as they have done it in the first round of fighting and continue to do the second round of fighting where they, their forces control some areas, northern Tigray and western Tigray. So we don't want this to continue. This is a choice. We don't have any other choice except to fight. But we are demanding the international community to have in place a proper, credible, impartial peace process, as I explained earlier. This starts with an immediate agreed cessation of hostilities. Once we stop shooting at each other, then and do certain things that will create a conducive environment for peace, then we go into a peace process that will culminate in a comprehensive ceasefire agreement. That comprehensive ceasefire agreement, in our opinion, will lead us into an all-inclusive political dialogue where all political parties in Ethiopia participate, including us, and then try to resolve the political predicament of this country in a manner where uh, uh, people's voices are properly heard. Uh, whether the current Prime Minister will continue as the Prime Minister or not, is up to the people of Ethiopia. They have to choose their leader, and that's, that's how it should be decided. But one thing that has to be clear is the fate of the state of Ethiopia and the fate of one leader are two different things. The state, the fate of the state of Ethiopia is now under serious jeopardy. We are begging, let's go into this process and try to save the state of Ethiopia. Uh, those are the points I have on both the current situation on uh, the ground and the diplomatic community. Thank you very much. I will uh, respond to some of your uh, questions. Thank you. Great. Well, well, thank you, General. I really appreciate um, that overview, and um, I was I was frantically scribbling notes here because there was a lot there. Um, I will I'll start with with just one quick question um, for those of you who uh, have questions yourselves. You can use um, the hand raise emoji, uh, and then I'll I'll call on you. Um, uh, so, so General, um, could you talk a little bit about the coordination between the Eritreans and the Ethiopians? Have you um, seen any sort of tension in that relationship, uh, or from your perspective, has it been uh, fairly seamless? Uh, well, there are reports that we get. Uh, there are uh, tension at the operational and tactical levels between the Ethiopian Army and the Eritrean Army. But for me, with regard to the bigger picture, with regard to the strategic uh, alignment, as long as Isaias and Abiy are in power, 
I don't think that will matter much. The military of both countries do whatever they are ordered to do, and they are doing that. Whatever small tension or disagreements might be there, at present are inconsequential. Uh, so that's how I see. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm going to start calling on people for questions. Uh, please identify yourself uh, when you before you ask your question. I also just want to remind people, as I stated in the email, this is on the record um, and it is being recorded. So just for your just a reminder for you all. Um, so we will go to Tibor. Okay, General, thank you very much again for joining us. Uh, uh, Josh, can you hear me? Okay. General, from your description of the military situation, uh, I can imagine that Prime Minister Abi and Isaias would feel like that they have a, an advantage and every day goes further to their advantage. Can you realistically uh, anticipate that there is a way open for the Tigrayan forces to uh, still have a victory or at most to protect Tigray? I mean, we all know how difficult the terrain is in Tigray and how impossible it is for a uh, invading army to hold it. So if you have to maintain the military uh, posture, is, uh, are the Tigray and defense forces capable of doing that? Again, thank you for joining us. Over. Uh, well, thank you, Ambassador Tibor. Uh, we are fighting a huge war. I don't think it will be easy for me to predict the outcome of that war. If what has happened up to now is an indicator or what has happened in the past is an indicator. Maybe we might, uh, lots of lives will, will be lost. We might take time, but at the end of the day, I sincerely believe the people of Tigray will prevail because they have justice in their side. They, have, they are fighting for their rights. I have been, uh, I have fought along uh, Isas army during uh, seven years of armed struggle. I have commanded the equipment and armed forces. And now for the third time, I'm fighting forces and against the forces that I help create and establish. So uh, up to now, we haven't faced major defeat. Not not me, but the people of Tigray. There is no reason why we don't be victorious in the future as well. What are we going to do? I think the Tigrayan people have uh, a way of adapting themselves to the current situation because they don't have any other choice. We don't have an outlet, so we get our bullets from our enemies. We have done that during the dirt, the 17 years, we'll continue to do that. Uh, 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 our food and provision was being provided by the Tigrayan people, however meager it might be, it will continue to be like that. And Tigrayan soldiers are not, uh, you know, uh, don't have much in terms of uh, uh, luxuries, if I may call it that way. So, uh, Loss of lives will be lost. It will be bad. So it's better to go into a peace process and resolve it peacefully. But if we have to fight, we know how to adapt the fighting and we'll continue fighting. And at the end of the day, since we are fighting for justice, for our rights, for equality, the different people didn't ask for anything. They just elected their own government and Isas and Abi came and uh, started the war. It's not whether the first, the first bullet was shot by Tigray or doesn't matter. The strategic preparations were finalized. So the choice for the people of Tigray is to fight and survive or succumb. And 
in this situation, it's not the ordinary type of, uh, you know, uh, accepting defeat. It is total extermination. That's what they do. That's their professed uh, aim. They are ideologists. Ideologists. Everybody else is doing. I'm, I'm saying that there's a propaganda in every aspect. So they are not killing us any other chance except to fight the finish. And if we are forced to fight the finish, we better come with solutions that will help us make the enemy not able to defeat us. That is the so. What I'm saying is. Nobody can predict the outcome of. Sorry, am I am I online? Hello. 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 Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, fine. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Anyway, we hear you. That's that's why what I would say. We have adapt based on our experience so far and then try to survive as people even when we are left alone by the international community that's the case up to now great uh thank you general um uh so um, we, we have a lot of questions here, so I'm going to ask our, uh, the people who have questions to make them very short uh, and, and to the point, please. Uh, and again, please remember to identify yourself. Uh, so, Ted, you are next. Thank you, Joshua. My, my question will be very brief. Uh, my name is Kewood Rose Turfe. I am the chairman of the Amhara Association of America. It's an advocacy group here in the United States. Um, General Saad Khan, in the TPLF's most recent statement on cessation of hostilities, the TPLF uh, has no longer set preconditions on the issue of Al-Qaeda. We believe this is a positive development and hope this is a sign that the TPLF has finally accepted the current status quo and historical administration of Al-Qaeda and Raya. As an organization, we have issued multiple statements condemning all human rights violations by all belligerents and have demanded unfettered humanitarian access for all Ethiopians. However, our organization, international human rights organizations, and many media outlets by uh, both Ethiopian and Western have documented gross human rights violations committed by TPLF militias in what amounts to a genocide, including massacre of thousands of Amara civilians, rape of thousands of Amara women, millions of Amaras displaced, blocking eight areas within Amara region held by TPLF, and destruction of civilian infrastructure. And similar crimes have been committed against Alfar civilians by the TPLF militias. How does the TPLF envision a lasting peace between Amharas, Alfars, and Tigrayans while the TPLF forces continue to commit war crimes? Thank you. Uh, number one, for the record, uh, the government of Tigray, by the way, I'm not a member of the TPLF, I'm a member, a member of the government of Tigray. The, the position of the government of Tigray is not to uh, not to accept the status quo. The position is things have to go back to November 2020, status quo ante. The administration has to come to Tigray, displaced people, about a million and uh, 200,000 of them, have to go back to their place, resume their normal life, and if need be, there is an issue to raise about, you know, to who that uh, area belongs, then there is another uh, constitutional process that we can, we can discuss and agree. But at first, it has to come back to the, the agreed constitutional uh, um, administration. So I think you need to get this straight. We did not... Uh, abandon that precondition. The only thing we said is, let's have a cessation of hostilities and discuss those issues. Uh, the second issue is, you can talk a lot about uh, atrocities committed by the Tigrayan forces. Uh, I'm not here to enumerate this or that, but the position of the government of Tigray 
and the position of the leadership of TDF is let's have a credible uh, 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 organization to verify who committed what kind of atrocities. We have been calling for an international investigation on this issue. If we are found to be guilty, we will live up to it. But we are very confident what our forces have done. We have a proper rules of engagement of the Ethiopian, I mean, the Tigrayan army. We have penalized our soldiers who have, who have committed crimes. And this and other kinds of human rights abuses, human rights cr crimes, uh, with a clear intent of exterminating the people of Tigray, are two different things. In any case, I'm not here to argue whether we have done this or that, but our position is let credible international investigators come invest it, investigate it, and then let the guilty party be known. It is the Ethiopian government who is refusing this, not the Tigrayan government. That's what I would like to say. Thank you, General. Um, so, Sina, uh, the next question to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, General Sarkin, for speaking to us. My name is Sina Dmitrimo. I'm the director for Oromo Legacy Leadership, an advocacy organization representing over 50 Oromo community. First and foremost, I want to say that our sympathy and heartfelt pain to the people of uh, Tigray is the number one thing I want to restate. Re re we feel the pain. We've seen the atrocity the Ethiopian government, along with the Amhara regional government, Amhara Fanos and Eritrean soldiers have committed to your people that I myself, I cannot imagine the pain your people feel. And I, and I appreciate that you're speaking here and telling us, that though my people itself is the victim to TPLF, but what's happening to the people of Tigray, it is unimaginable. And your survival is a miracle. My God be with you guys. So my question quickly is, one, why do you think, you know, uh, the U.S. government have not really pushed it up and the government to keep the bargain three times, you know, you say that they made a deal? Second, quickly, is the Amhara uh, Fanos. Just this week, uh, over 100 or almost were killed by Amhara Fanos. Amhara Fanos are accused of genocide in Tigray about a year ago. Right now, there seem to be division, but they have focused their atrocities into Romia. They've done hundreds of people, they have killed hundreds of people in other regions than to drive them back to Romia. So uh, what's, what's with your analysis? Because you have not really called out much on the Panos re uh, recent involvement. The third question quickly is about the TPLF and oil based relationship. What the argument is, they, uh, if, if there's something that you can say. And again, thank you so much, uh, Josh, for the opportunity. Uh, well, thank you very much for the sympathy that you have expressed to the people of Tigray. I really appreciate it. Uh, with regard to uh, the issues of the relationship of OLA and uh, TDF, this has been forged some years and a half ago. Uh, if at all there is anything, this tells that the Tigrayan authorities and TDF are trying their best to save the state of Ethiopia on the clear understanding and participation of all Ethiopians. That's the whole, the whole purpose. This goes to uh, the Amharas, to uh, all sorts of uh, people in Ethiopia. You know, in my opinion, there are two clear uh, trajectories of state building in Ethiopia. One is uh, the multinational federal democratic system, which has been established by the victory of the APRDF with all its uh, problems and excesses. But the trajectory is Ethiopians have to govern their own affairs by themselves and then cooperate in building the, uh, the Ethiopian state together. The other one is they say, no, we have to have a centralized state where other people shall not uh, be um, allowed to administer their own affairs by themselves. There is a fight between those two uh, ideologies. And this can only be resolved by peaceful process, by peaceful election. If the Ethiopian people elect 
uh, not by force, but by voluntary democratic process to go into a unitary system, then that's one, one way of uh, building the Ethiopian state. Or the other one is the other aspect as well. I know uh, what, what I would like to say is the relationship of the OLA and the TDF or the, the Tigrayan authorities is based on this multinational federal constitutional arrangement and it will continue to be so. This does not exclude anybody. It includes anybody who has this vision of building an Ethiopian state that will gradually uh, evolve into uh, a strong state. So uh, I, I do really sympathize with the atrocities that are being committed in Oromia as well. Uh, and by the way, these atrocities are happening anywhere, not only in Oromia and Tigray, but in many parts of Ethiopia where there is an opposition to the Ethiopian central government. And I thank you very much. Thank you, General. Um, go to uh, Terry uh, next. Uh, thank you, Josh, <clears throat> and thank you, General Sadkan, uh, for that uh, uh, detailed uh, briefing. This is uh, Terence Lyons from George Mason University. I, I want, in some ways, my question is a uh, takes off on the last two questions as well, but let me phrase it a little bit differently. What I kept writing down when I was listening to you and then underlined and then put stars next to was the phrase credible, impartial, and robust uh, peace process. Uh, I mean, credible and robust, I, I think, are clear. Robust, you talked about the need for guarantors and uh, peace process uh, architecture. What I would is not as clear to me as what you mean by impartial. And let me put it my question directly this way. Is it the uh, uh, government of Tigray's position that support for the 1995 constitution is the impartial position, uh, or does the government of Tigray see this as a highly contentious position in which other actors to the conflict uh, do not accept? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Arans. Uh, and uh, I, our position, the position of the government of Tigray is any peace process that shall go forward has to accept, in our opinion, it is, uh, of course, contingent to uh, our uh, other partners to accept this as well, has to accept the 1995 constitution as a basis for resolving the conflict in Ethiopia. We don't see it as impartial, well, others, there, I know there are other forces who say this has to be scrapped. Well, this has to be scrapped on the basis of the will of the Ethiopian people. It shall not be scrapped by means of arms. That's where the problem comes. If this is put into a verdict of the Ethiopian population, uh, it gives all chances uh, of... Uh, uh, amending it, uh, uh, you know, uh, see the experience so far, and then develop it. Or other parts might say it's not for us, and uh, we shall uh, we shall go our own way. So, but uh, if I have clearly understood your question, I don't see it as impartial. I see it as a basis for resolving the problems in Ethiopia, not only in Tigray, but in other parts of Ethiopia as well. Okay, thank you, General. Um, so uh, we, we have two minutes left in our allotted time here. Uh, General, do you have an extra five minutes to spare if, if we go a little bit long? Fine, go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, Johannes, you're next. Yeah, I need to unmute Johannes. All right. Thanks, Josh, for the opportunity. And uh, please allow me to use this opportunity to thank General Adkan for his time as well. Uh, first of all, my sympathy also goes 
to the uh, our typical people of Tigray and Nasser. Uh, but particularly, General Tadkan, uh, I would like also to take the opportunity to witness uh, uh, your uh, commitment to a peaceful resolution of the crisis when it, been, uh, it all began. And I'm extremely happy to see you as one of the negotiators along with that with that show in this process. And it is my prayer and my hope that you will uh, help uh, the uh, international community as well to make sure that uh, this crisis uh, should be fully resolved. Uh, quickly, my question to you, General Farkan. Uh, what do you think is the international community uh, taking so much long in uh, helping uh, this uh, process to, to end and uh, resolve it peacefully? Do you think the international community, whether the African Union, the United Nations, the Security Council, are they all coordinated to approach this process and to end the war, or everybody has different agenda. If they do have different agenda, what is their agenda in the horn? Do they have a clarity that they are guided this approach? Because if they are not really coordinated, then I think what would be your advice to this international community in this process? That's my first question, uh, John Sankar. And I'm extremely again happy that to hear you say how committed you are not only to address the issues integrated, but also overall in the country. Your commitment to saving Ethiopia is really, really highly appreciated. And I would like to take this opportunity, General Sarkan. What would you say to the people of Ethiopia, not just to the few uh, people, but I think the majority of Ethiopia who are committed to see uh, a peaceful resolution? How do you want them to support this process? So that at the end of the day, uh, we have uh, an Ethiopia that we all wanted uh, to, to, to have. So this is just my couple of questions to you, General Sarkar. Well, thank you very much. And uh, nice to see you again in, in such uh, an arrangement. In any case, uh, for the people of Ethiopia, what I would like to say is let's stop this madness, let's stop this war, let's agree on cessation of hostilities and discuss our differences, resolve our differences peacefully. I very much know there are so much divergent uh, opinions on the future of Ethiopia, how the Ethiopian state should be, uh, should be managed and developed. This is something that we have to discuss among ourselves and resolve it peacefully. We might not agree on all issues, but as normal in any as in, in, in the rest of the world, if there is a genuine uh, participation, then uh, the other issues on the basis of the current constitution could be resolved. Uh, I don't need to go into the details of the political discussion because that's a huge issue that has to be uh, first, when we reach there, uh, the, uh, I'm asked about the international community. Number one, I would like to again appreciate the American government for their commitment so far and assisting the process to come into an understanding in the in the past. Above all, I really appreciate what the American government has done in terms of humanitarian aid the people of Tigray, which reached the people of Tigray at a very critical moment. Apart from this, then uh, there are issues that I don't understand either. It is for the American government to explain. Uh, I have put the strategic uh, significance of this, this war. He says is the architect of this war. He is leading the whole uh, thing. He has allied himself with the Russians and uh, trying to make it a, a regional war. Uh, and we are here fighting for our right, for our survival. Uh, it looks like recently the international community have allowed both Isaias and Abi to get their way. 
to whatever they can to defeat us militarily for a one month and a half, non-stop, day and night fighting. The international community is watching. We are blockaded. We have no outlet. We don't have any resources. But this has continued. Why is the international community, we have clearly put our proposal on a peace process to start from a cessation of hostilities and then continue the next process. But there is no strong reaction to make it happen. Why is that so? I don't know. It is for the international community to respond, to see and do something. And actually, to be honest, I feel this kind of interaction will help in forging uh, opinions for the peace. That's what I can say. Thank you, General. Um, okay, so we're to our very last question here. Um, for Hanu, you get to do the honors for the last question. Thank you, General. Uh, you're, I don't hear you well. Um, is it okay now? That's better, yes. Okay. Um, first, General, thank you for uh, your time. Um, knowing, knowing you can see me, you recognize me or not, Knowing your position before the uh, I'm sorry that you are uh, trapped in this situation. Um, because uh, you were a peacemaker, uh, not uh, uh, a general uh, before the war. Um, having said that, um, um, I, regardless of uh, thinker, but uh, I think many people who are 
know your career are also aware that you're um, a peacemaker or, or someone who wishes very much for peace. And um, I think everybody on this call wishes for that as well. So um, uh, let us all hope and pray for that that comes quickly. Um, in the meantime, uh, thank you again, General. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. Uh, appreciate your time and uh, wish you all the best. Uh, and I'll give any final comments to you, General. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate what uh, appreciate the participation in this discussion. I hope it will uh, help uh, bringing ideas for this piece. Thank you. Thanks, General. And thank you, everybody who thank joined. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, General. Let the peacemakers prevail. Indeed. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Josh. Thanks, Josh. Great discussion. Yeah, you did a great job. <laughs>